Okay, thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you all for attending today. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about uh, basically fruit plant maintenance. And this is, uh, this is going to be uh, mainly fruit trees that we're talking about. We will get into berries a little bit. And the, the calendar that, that uh, Rob shared, uh, yeah, uh, please cross-reference it as we're, as we're going uh, through this presentation. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, a few different types of maintenance. Um, so maintenance of, of trees during the early years. So this uh, basically means um, training those fruit trees. So this is this is before fruiting. Um, we'll we'll go over pruning details. We'll go over maintenance during the fruiting years. And then we'll go over insects, diseases, and pest management. So this is a, a really a, a broad shot across the bow uh, for uh, fruit tree maintenance. So I just want to go over some of the things that, that are uh, sort of necessary uh, in uh, some of the tools and supplies that are necessary uh, in fruit tree maintenance. So some of these are, are kind of no-brainers. You already you already have things like watering supplies. Uh, if you're a gardener, you have these things. However, when it comes to pruning supplies, uh, this, this becomes a little bit more important. And so having hand pruners uh, is going to be very important. Having a hand saw is going to be important as your tree grows and, and the hand pruners no longer cut through that half inch, inch, uh, inch and a half um, diameter wood. Loppers are important to have. I don't like to use them for pruning fruit trees, but they're really great for uh, when it comes to, to berries and brambles and shrubs. Rubbing alcohol is important because you want to sanitize your hand pruners uh, as, you're, as you're going from tree to tree. Now, there's going to be a pruning workshop next week, and we're going to get in depth a little bit on that. Uh, then limb spreaders and tie tape. Uh, some of the rest of this, like pest traps, uh, we will talk a little bit about that when we get into the, the fruit pest portion of this. Sprayers are also going to be important. Uh, it can be very difficult to manage fruit trees uh, without applying some sort of insecticide or fungicide. Now, this doesn't mean that it has to be a noxious insecticide or fungicide. Um, it, it can also be an organic insecticide and fungicide, but you will need to spray your fruit trees at some point in time. Um, and then some of these other things like a, like a rain gauge, that's important so you know when to water and how much to water. Uh, pesticides and fertilizers for sure. And an orchard ladder. Uh, this is something that, especially if you have a few fruit trees, uh, it's very important to uh, invest in an orchard ladder. And this is typically a, uh, a specialized ladder. Uh, uh, the type, the brand that we like to use around here is Stokes. And you could look them up, uh, Stokes Ladders. And it's basically a wider base with a third leg, so a very stable ladder. Here again is that uh, fruit. Here, here again is that monthly fruit management calendar that uh, Rob uh, sent sent you the link to. And so, uh, you know, January has has come and gone, and uh, you know that's 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 when you don't have to worry too much about your trees. Now, February, I will tell you, is actually kind of a busy month, and and. Uh, in, in the life of a fruit tree, in the life of an orchardist, because you're doing a lot of pruning, you're doing spraying, and you're also having to try to work around the weather. And oftentimes the weather is, is not beneficial to some of these activities. So, so what you don't get done in February, you need to get done in March. And so February and March are, are are some of the busier months because you're getting all your pruning in and you're also doing some spraying during those months. Uh, April is also a time for, for spraying. And actually, 
It's a time for pinching off fruits or flowers on newly planted trees and shrubs. And we'll talk about this in depth a little bit more. May is a time to thin fruits. It's also when strawberries begin to uh, harvest. And then you see with June, there's, there's a little bit more. So this kind of lays it out month by month what you can expect to do. And we'll go through some of this stuff individually uh, as the presentation continues. So let's get into pruning. And while we are hosting a, a, uh, a on-site pruning workshop next, next Friday, I wanna go over just some of the principles of pruning fruit trees and why we prune fruit trees. So strong tree structure, that's going to be first. Uh, these are all holding quite a bit, quite a bit of weight. And so you, you can imagine that uh, if each fruit on an apple tree weighs a half pound and you have 400 fruits, all of a sudden you have 200 pounds, 200 extra pounds of weight on that tree. So you have to have, you have to have a very strong limb structure uh, and, and no tight branch angles. Uh, so you prune also to increase light intensity into the tree canopy. Why is light intensity important? Well, light intensity drives fruit bud development, uh, which drives flowers and fruits. And then that light intensity will also help with the ripening of fruits, uh, as opposed to having a very dark inner canopy which uh, then the fruit does not ripen and oftentimes we'll, we'll get some sort of fruit rot. Speaking to that, uh, pruning will also increase airflow and reduce humidity in the, in the tree canopy. Uh, increased humidity within the tree canopy can lead to a number of different diseases and fruit rots. Uh, also pruning is uh, necessary to remove broken limbs or bad branch angles. And we'll talk about these a little bit more. Also removing diseased limbs. Uh, you're able to improve the fruit quality and quantity. And so that's, that's also very important. And there are different, uh, you know, different pruning tricks for different species. Apples are going to be a little bit different than peaches. And that speaks to both quantity and quality of fruits too. Uh, it also controls the size of the fruit tree. So fruit trees do grow quickly. And that is actually one of the bigger issues with fruit trees is sometimes they'll get a little unwieldy. Once a tree gets above 15 feet tall, it can be a little bit harder to manage. And so pruning to stump the growth is also very important. And that's actually why we practice a lot of summer pruning on our fruit trees around here. And yes, the trees do grow fast. In some cases, you'll see four to six feet of growth in a growing season. So that can be hard to keep up with, uh, especially if you don't do it yearly or even twice a year. So here we are with uh, uh, kind of some of the, the first principles of pruning here. And if any of you have purchased, uh, pre-ordered a fruit tree from us, a bare root fruit tree, many of the trees will be coming in looking like the picture there on the left, uh, just a twig. Uh, uh, they're actually called whips. Um, and these are typically unbranched. And actually having them unbranched is beneficial to you because then you can decide how the shape of the tree is going to go. So here you have this unbranched tree and it's typically maybe four to five feet tall. Well, you will want to get it started in branching. And the way you do this is actually by cutting the top, by heading the whip and that will help promote branching. So that's going to be one of the first things. And really, uh, the I kind of like branching to start at about 30 inches to three feet from the ground. That's a good level where it, uh, it won't get in the way so much of mowing. 
and also it will allow you to install some sort of baffle or um, protectorant device to keep squirrels, raccoons, or possums from getting up into the tree. So here we are kind of pruning the fruit trees, and this, this happens to be an apple that we're talking about here. Um, so we, we kind of go back to our, our previous slide, and you have your whip, and then you have kind of your, your, uh, your branched first year tree. And then as we go on, we have even more growth. And that's just it. These things, they do grow a lot. And you then have to choose how it's going to grow. Uh, with apples and, well, really with all fruit trees, you don't want too many limbs that are going to be right on top of one another. You don't want limbs that are going to be crossing. You want limbs that are going to be spread evenly around the trunk and evenly spaced as you go up the trunk. And so that's what we're talking about here. We're, we're talking about having that vision of the tree shape. And we're also talking about forming these, these scaffolds, especially with apples in particular. Uh, these scaffolds are basically collections of lateral limbs that come around the trunk and you want good spacing equidistant. Now with peaches, they are definitely a separate animal and require a different style of pruning. So with peaches right here, you, uh, you kind of look at the at planting right here. So this, this would be, you get your bare root peach in, you see that it's this single stem with maybe a couple of little branch stubs. Well, this is where you actually want to head it back and you want to prune off some of these lower branches. And once you've headed it back, you'll see that you get pruning cut reactions. And this would be later on, let's say this year, so the, uh, June of 2022. So then you have these branches that are coming out. They grow and grow. Now here we are in winter of 2023, February of 2023. You have all of that growth from 2022. Then you want to prune some of it out to make sure the peach tree is open. Now, uh, the style of pruning for peach trees is called open vase. And peaches are, are very distinct from, from apples, from pears, from even other stone fruits like cherries and plums. And uh, they only have fruit buds that will last for one year. And they end up growing new fruit buds every year. So because of that, you do have to prune them quite a bit. And pruning them to an open vase also allows for more sunlight and more airflow to get into the peach. We could do a whole hour, two hour long section just on peaches, but we're kind of, this is a broad shot across the bow again. So uh, sort of speaking to uh, these different styles of pruning and structural pruning, uh, so here we have some of the different styles. We have central leader, which we talked about that with apple tree. Well, it's also how pear trees are typically grown. If you, uh, if you come to the office here and see how some of the trees have been pruned, you will see that uh, most of our pear and apple trees are, are very much either central leader or what's called modified central leader. Now cherries and plums also take this modified central leader pruning. Uh, however, when we get into the peaches, that's when we're doing open vase style of pruning. And so I do invite you all to come by here and visit the demonstration orchard and you can see these different pruning techniques on these different crops. So now that we kind of have an idea of, of some of these styles of pruning, uh, how do we actually achieve good branch angles 
uh, and and get the tree to look the way it should look for for maximum production and for good branch angles for structural stability. So a lot of this is yeah getting these branch angles formed, and when the when the wood is young on these trees it is very pliable. And that is really the best time when you can help set a branch structure and branch angle. So you'll see how this clothespin has been set, uh, clipped around the central leader, the main trunk, and then it's, uh, it's bending that branch outward and helping increase that branch angle. So really tight branch angles are prone to breakage and having branch angles of about 45 to 60 degrees is kind of the optimum angle. Uh, at, at that angle, that's when branches are going to be the most structurally sound. So here we are with a, a European pear. And this was at a pruning workshop a number of years ago. Uh, if any of you have taken pictures of, of uh, trees in the wintertime, you know sometimes they're just a big collection of sticks. Uh, so we decided that we needed to have something behind the tree so we could actually see what, what we're uh, looking at here. So this happens to be a European pear that has been in the ground for, I believe, two years. And we were pruning this uh, so we could get down to one central leader on the tree. And many of you may have some trees that look like this at this point in time. And, and if you're to look at this tree in the before picture, you're thinking, well, this isn't really too much of a problem. But actually, when you look at it from a structural point, and when you look at it from a fruit production point, it is really a problem. So uh, the, the main problem is this has many, it has, sure, it has a central leader, you can kind of tell, but then it has these multiple trunks that are also ready to become leaders as well. So they, they have about the same uh, branch diameter as the central leader, and they are almost as tall as the central leader. So the reason that becomes a problem is as the tree grows, those angles are really tight. The weight of the wood is also really heavy. So with those tight angles and the weight of that wood, the tree will end up splitting out. And European and Asian pears uh, share those genetics, those, those traits. They are prone to splitting out if, if you have poor branch angles and if you have too much weight on the branches. So we ended up pruning this tree, heading back some of those, some of those other leaders, I will call them, and choosing the central leader. And then you can see we put limb spreaders in these trees to help increase the branch angle. So this was almost a radical pruning, but it was to help solve some problems and the tree is, is much better now because of that. You don't want your tree to turn into something like this. And, and that was definitely the fear of that tree in, in the last slide. You notice this is also a European pear tree. And this was a European pear tree that really was never pruned. It was planted and, and kind of, you know, not forgotten about. I mean, people knew that it was a pear tree, but they just didn't know that it needed to be pruned. And so if you, if you look at this tree here, you will see, you will see the very narrow branch angles. Where's my mouse? There it is. So you'll see the very narrow branch angles near the base. You'll see as you go up, there are just narrow branches all over the place. And then you will see that a number of these uh, upright shoots have actually twisted around inside the canopy. So this, this becomes very problematic. Uh, sure, this is still a 
Now, this is still fixing carbon in the atmosphere. It's still providing shade, but it's not doing what you want it to do. It's not producing good fruit. Uh, it Yes, it does produce fruit, but because all of the branches are so close together, the fruits that were being formed on there were getting constantly rubbed by the twigs and the limbs and so the fruit was was becoming soft and and uh, rotten before it had a chance to ripen. So a little bit problematic, and you don't want your trees to get to this point. And like I say, this has competing central leaders. It has narrow branch angles and twisted limbs, all of those. So another thing that you want to watch out for with your fruit trees is, uh, well, don't get suckered. And this is, this is something. So nearly all fruit trees, and I'm talking trees, I'm not talking shrubs, but trees uh, have been grafted, which means they have a root stock that uh, the main scion or the variety is attached to. So oftentimes that root stock is a completely different species. So uh, a lot of apples are grafted onto crabapple rootstock. A lot of pears are grafted onto a different pear species, not necessarily an edible pear species. And the reason why they are grafted is um, one, these, these varieties that are grown, you can't just propagate them by seed. Uh, so they're propagated by cuttings. However, these you can't just root these cuttings. You have to attach them to an actual root stock. That root stock can control the uh, size of the tree. It can also uh, uh, help the tree adapt to certain soil types. So lots of reasons to have root stock out there. But what will happen is if you're not careful, you will notice these little suckers that will start to emerge from below the graft. And the graft is the point at which those two trees are, are attached together. So those, those the, the rootstock suckers will emerge and then they'll grow and they will start to outcompete for sunlight, for nutrients, for everything with the variety that you are trying to, to grow. So if you see something like this, First of all, you, you need to understand, well, with, what's the rootstock and, and what is the variety? Oftentimes you can tell that, it's pretty apparent, um, but sometimes if the rootstock suckers have been let go for too long, it may not necessarily be apparent. Uh, but when you see them, you just need to cut them out. Uh, really any time of year is, is good to do. Uh, oftentimes we're doing it in the dormant season, uh, or we're doing it in midsummer, but uh, really, if you see them, cut them out. So here we are, another little pruning uh, example here, and this this would be uh, using limb spreaders when we prune, and I think you saw that in in one of the other slides where we had a a pear tree and we had installed the limb spreaders. Uh, these limb spreaders are good for creating those, those nice branch angles. Um, and they would just be staying within the tree uh, for about a growing season. If you leave them in any longer than a growing season, uh, the, the tree will can start to grow around the limb spreader and, and then the, uh, it can end up damaging the tree or it can end up breaking the limb spreader too. It's, it's actually the tree that you care about a little bit more. So here is a uh, sort of simplified pruning schedule. And this is, uh, so basically now through bud break, we'll say, uh, which bud break you know, typically is going to be anywhere from the 1st of March to uh, mid-March. And my guess is this year it's probably going to be more mid-March. We've uh, we've had sort of a, a prolonged uh, cold February, not as bad as last February. Um, so now is the time to prune fruit trees. 
And really you wanna make sure that you're pruning them when the temperatures are above freezing. Uh, if Sometimes if you end up pruning these trees when the temperature is below freezing, the wood will end up cracking. Uh, so you do have to be careful about that. This is also a time to prune uh, blackberries. And if you have not removed last year's fruited canes, uh, you need to do that. That actually should have been done last year uh, and thin out any excessive growth if necessary and, and then prune the laterals. Now I've got a slide on blackberries that we'll talk about because uh, blackberries are kind of their own animal. Uh, raspberries, if they are primocane raspberries, and the variety that we sell, Caroline, is a primocane as well as heritage. Um, this is when you would just cut everything down. So uh, you would prune this down to the crown and then they'll start to reemerge. And then if anybody has figs, um, oftentimes I like to wait to prune figs until I know they have budded out. And this is normally a late April time frame. And then you just prune them to right above where they have started budding out. And then in the summertime, uh, we're always managing blackberries because they, they have their new growth and then they have their old growth. And then ap apples and pears, we uh, remove a lot of suckers and water sprouts. And uh, then we will also top some of our apple and pear trees to help stunt the growth. And that is sort of a separate style of pruning. So now I kind of want to get into some of the other tasks. So we've done a, a really broad overview of pruning. Uh, then I want to get into these other tasks that you will be doing on some of your trees or, or ought to be doing on some of your fruit trees. Uh, dormant oil spray is a good idea. And uh, the reason there is is there can be a lot of different mites uh, or scales, scales and mites mainly, uh, that could end up causing foliar problems or in some cases fruit problems. And so that would be applied this time of year. Uh, removing or pinching off blossoms, that's something that you'll do. We'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, tree training, blackberries, summer pruning and mulching. So these are all things that you'll want to think about doing in year one and two. Now, as your fruit trees age a little bit more, uh, the, the time that it takes uh, per tree is going to definitely be a little bit more. Um, you'll be doing all of the same tasks from year one and two. However, then you'll be uh, worried more about actual fruit production, and then you'll be getting into spraying for some of the insects that we're going, some of the fruit pest insects that we're going to be talking about. You'll also be fruit thinning. We'll talk about fruit thinning and what that means. And um, so, yeah, so as the years go on, the maintenance does increase. Uh, but the reward increases too, because you are actually producing your own fruit, which really the best fruit is the one that comes from right outside your back door or your front door. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about blossom and fruit pinching. And so with, with in general, all trees that have plant, been planted within the past couple of years, it is a good idea to remove the blossoms on those. And the reason there is really for the first couple of years in the ground, you want roots and shoots and not fruits. So you want that tree to get rooted in and you want a really nice branch structure. You want to make sure that that tree can hold the fruit weight. Um, and, and you're not, and fruits, you know, they take away nutrients and they take away water from the rest of the tree. So the way this is oftentimes done is you're just going through manually with your thumb and forefinger and just pinching off the flower or if you didn't get to it, the fruit. And so it's just as simple as this. Now, when you have a lot of blossoms or a lot of fruits that can actually take a little bit of time 
but you're doing that for the health of the tree. So um, also I want you to notice, leave the leaves. So you know we, we've advised over the years for those very young trees, those newly planted year one and year two trees to pinch off the blossoms, pinch off any little fruits. We've had some folks that actually end up pinching off the leaves as well. So don't pinch off the leaves. The leaves are necessary for photosynthesis. They're necessary for your tree to survive. So I uh, just wanted to clarify that. Now here is what's called fruit thinning. And fruit thinning is something that is practiced as your trees get older and into fruit production. So fruit thinning is very much a manual process. A lot of the commercial orchards actually will spray chemical thinners on their trees uh, because it is a quite laborious process. Um, however, the reason you end up thinning fruits is so you actually have a full-sized fruit when it ripens. That's one of the reasons. Um, so imagine if if all of these fruits were left on, on the top uh, top slot or top picture here. So they would all be fairly small. They would probably end up being just a little bit larger than a golf ball once ripe. Uh, also, anywhere where a fruit is actually touching another fruit, that is a spot for an insect to get in and actually start eating away at that fruit. Also, as these fruits kind of bang against one another, it, it creates soft spots and can create rot spots. So thinning your fruits down to about one per cluster, sometimes two per cluster is, is how you can uh, thin, just as long as the fruits are not touching. And so this is a process that happens in May and June for uh, most of our fruit crops. Now, in some cases, you will get what's called a June drop on uh, many fruits. Uh, however, you can't always rely on the June drop uh, dropping the, the correct fruits. The other thing that fruit thinning does is it allows you to go through and kind of pick and choose the best fruits. Sometimes what happens when, when fruits get uh, pollinated is, or when the blossoms get pollinated, they don't get fully pollinated. And so you will have misshapen fruits. Uh, also, if an insect has gotten into any of those young fruits, you can end up culling out those insect damaged fruits. So fruit thinning is a, a very important task that definitely should be done with your fruit trees in that May, June time period. And here, this kind of speaks to uh, thinning fruits a little bit more. So this is on an Asian pear and these fruits in the, in the top photo, they were, they were nested together like that on the tree. And you notice when those fruits are rotated, you see the two little, little spots there. So those are soft spots and those are spots that are just prime for any number of insects to get in and then start eating that fruit. So, so once again, a great reason to be thinning your fruit and, and there is kind of the size in which you should be uh, removing your fruits. I will tell you as uh, the, the larger the fruits get, the harder the stem gets and the more difficult it is to actually thin the fruit. So doing it when these, when these fruits are young and small uh, is a lot easier. And here's yet another reason to thin fruit. So you, you see the, uh, the broken out peach in the upper photo. Um, not uncommon. You, you see this happen a lot. And, you know, you actually, you, you look at uh, this bottom photo and you say, hey, that, that looks excellent. And in some cases, yeah, you get a lot of good fruit there. Uh, I will tell you that those peaches are fairly small for what they should be, though. 
And if we were to peel, uh, start harvesting some of those, you would see that you will have insect infestations in a lot of these places where the fruits are touching. So do that fruit thinning. Okay, so here we are. Uh, I promised we would talk a little bit about blackberries and, and maintaining them. Uh, a lot of people uh, purchase blackberries and uh, maybe they'll buy one plant or two plants at a go. And, oh yeah, then I'm going to go ahead and uh, train this along my chain link fence or, or something along that, along those lines. Um, that can be done, but I will tell you it, it can be uh, somewhat difficult to end up maintaining them. And the reason why is blackberries, so they are a perennial crop, but they have biennial canes. So what that means is the canes life cycle actually uh, lasts two years. So our blackberry patch that we have out here, we'll be getting fruits on the blackberries coming up this June, they'll be ripening mid-June to, to early July. Those canes actually got started last year. So they started growing out of the ground, they got tall, we tied them up to a trellis line, and now this year, after we do some pruning on them, we'll do this what's called tip pruning lateral uh, on these laterals. Uh, then they will go ahead and flower and produce fruits on those canes. Meanwhile, while those fruits are being produced, they're getting harvested, there's a whole new set of canes that is emerging from the ground. And those canes will bear fruit the following year. So this is a process with blackberries where you're always sort of rejuvenating. You're, you're taking out the old canes that have fruited and you're training the new canes. And the reason why you want to get the old canes out is those old canes will end up harboring not only different diseases and funguses, but in many cases, things like the uh, redneck cane borer, which is actually a, a pretty, pretty bad pest of blackberries. Uh, so you wanna get those, those old canes out, those fruited canes out before they have a chance to host any of the fungal or insect pests. So what we do with most of our trellises is we're just doing kind of a, a simple clothesline style trellis. And this is oftentimes a post with a, a, a crossbar on it and then two lines running. And if you, if you come out to the community gardens, you'll see we do have uh, one of these trellises set up uh, so you can see how that works. <clears throat> and this is uh, this time of year, actually. So this is a, a February picture from a couple years back. And this is kind of the before pruning. So these were all of all of last year's canes that were actually tied up to one line, which is good. So, so this uh, this orchard steward was was doing doing the right thing. However, you can see there are just a whole lot of canes, and so we ended up thinning out those canes and actually have a lot of uh, a lot of little lateral stubs along here. And now all of the fruit is going to be produced all along these canes. If we were to have left all of this growth here, yes, there would still be fruit, but actually there would almost be too much foliar growth and a lot of that fruit would end up uh, getting rotten. So you, you actually have to, to end up pruning out quite a bit on your blackberries. So here is a uh, just a little bit about pruning raspberries, and I mentioned this earlier. Uh, the raspberry varieties that we historically uh, have sold have always been primocane varieties, meaning that um, you treat them just like perennials, really. They, they emerge in the spring, 
They put on fruits in late summer, so uh, late July, early August. They fruit until the first hard freeze. And after the hard freeze, uh, the, the foliage starts to color up and fall off. Then once that happens, you can just cut those right down. So that's, that's pretty easy there. Um, now with the floricanes, the floricane varieties are, are basically the same as blackberries. So they would be treated that same way. And there are uh, varieties like black raspberries, purple raspberries, and then there are some of those other floricane varieties you would treat the same way uh, as you would blackberries. So ring mulching, another one of those, uh, another one of those tasks that you will be doing. Uh, can't say enough good things about mulch, uh, wood, especially wood chip mulch. This is something that you will want to do for any of your fruit trees. Now, I just prefer kind of regular hardwood mulch, the kind you would get in bulk from, um, from a garden center. But if, uh, you know, I realize that bagged mulch, there are lots of different varieties of bagged mulch and, and uh, there's, there's cedar and cypress. Uh, the, the problem with some of those cedar and cypress mulches is they actually don't break down. Part of the thing with mulch is you actually want it to break down. Uh, mulch ends up adding a lot of organic material to the soil. Uh, so, so think about that kind of next time you're out purchase, purchasing mulch. Um, but another thing that mulch does is it helps retain moisture. Um, it also helps moderate temperatures, moderate soil temperatures. So uh, in the middle of the summer, it's 100 degrees. Well, if you have bare soil beneath your tree, uh, that soil is really going to heat up and it's going to dry out a lot more. Now, conversely, in the winter time, we have zero degrees, uh, so that soil will get cold, and also it could dry out too. So, so mulch just acts as kind of an insulation, as, as a blanket. Uh, it also helps outcompete weeds. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's something that we definitely recommend. And oftentimes this is in an 18 inch to, to two foot radius uh, around the trunk. All right, so now we're uh, kind of, we're, we're out of some of the maintenance on this. And now we're gonna look a little bit at some of the diseases uh, and, and then we'll be looking at some of the pests on fruit trees. And, and this isn't meant to scare anyone away, but it's just kind of just, just for your knowledge. Um, so I will want to point out, especially when we talk about apple here. Uh, so all four of these, these fungus and disease up here, uh, the, the varieties of apples that we sell, uh, they actually have really good resistance to all of these. Uh, so that's not something that you'd have to worry about uh, when you're purchasing the varieties that we offer. Now, uh, some of these other things with the, with the uh, pears, like fire blight, uh, we do try to make sure a lot of our uh, pear varieties have good fire blight resistance. Uh, pear scab is something, however, that uh, there's no resistance to. And then when we talk uh, peaches, peach leaf pearl, there's some varieties have better natural resistance than others. Uh, the Red Haven variety has pretty decent resistance to peach leaf pearl, however, it still gets it. Uh, but bacterial spot, is something that um, our peaches do have good resistance to. Brown rot, there's not good resistance to. However, early ripening varieties can oftentimes avoid brown rot. And then peach canker, there is no resistance to. 
And then cherry, these are, these are also uh, some of the, the diseases and funguses that, that you well face. So we'll talk about a handful of these. First off, I want to talk about fire blight. This is one that uh, affects apples, pears, and Asian pears. And it's something that we have faced uh, here, uh, here at the shop uh, in the beanstalk garden and with some of our trees. So it's a bacteria that ends up spreading from tree to tree. And some years are, are far worse than others. So it's, uh, it's identifiable mostly by looking at the ends of branches and seeing what looks like a scorched tip of the branch. This is basically a fire blight infection that came in through the flowers, uh, which was brought in by a bee or some other pollinator. So it was spread from tree to tree. And it just so happened that this tree, uh, the, the, the weather was right, the pathogen was there, and it spread uh, into the tree. And the problem with fire blight is it can spread into the tree, so in through the branches, and then it can get into the trunk and kill the entire tree. So the best thing to do with fire blight is just to flat out prune it out but you need to be able to recognize it first and know that it is fire blight. Brown rot is something that is typically a host on stone fruits. So when I say stone fruits, peaches, cherries, plums, apricots, uh, all of those. And it's, it's uh, oftentimes, uh, it happens during high humidity and basically you have to have overwintering spores. So if you look at the photo down below, you see all of these, these are called mummies. These are the dried out fruits from last year. And oftentimes you will have spores that have overwintered on these dried out fruits. And then the conditions are right. And the brown rot sporulates and then ends up getting on fruits. So this is something that can be avoided simply by pruning out or removing any of the uh, last year's old fruit. And I'm sure some of you have seen this before. And if, if you have, you'll know that if you just touch a twig or, or, or a fruit that has brown rot on it, those spores will just cast to the wind and then start infecting other fruits. So the big, the big way to avoid this is sanitation, removing the rotted fruits, last year's old fruits, and pruning too, uh, opening up the tree, uh, opening up the tree canopy, making sure that the growth is not too thick in the middle. Um, and then there are some definitely fungicides that can work, but uh, the first thing is, is the cultural practices. So this is peach leaf curl. <clears throat> and this is something that uh, can happen annually on peaches. Um, and so if you'll, if you'll see in the, in the notes on the side, uh, when you see this in mid-April, don't call us. So you're, you're taking this workshop now. You, you, you now know what peach leaf curl is. I, I know I will still get calls about this. It's, it's something that happens year in and year out. And uh, oftentimes, it's, uh, if the weather is just right, it will, it will be really bad. And, and it, it, yeah, almost every year. Anyhow, uh, when you see it at this stage, realize that nothing can actually be done about it at that time. But this is something that it, it gets into the plant and it gets into the buds of the plant. Uh, and actually the best time to treat this is when the tree is mostly defoliated in November. And then you would end up spraying uh, a fungicide on the tree to help solve that problem. So uh, if, if you do have peaches and you've seen this, uh, and you did not get the spray on, let's say this past November, 
you can actually reapply a copper fungicide coming up here really shortly uh, at what's called bud swell, uh, when, when the buds are really, uh, really swollen, almost ready to burst open, uh, is the time to spray a copper fungicide to help prevent peach leaf curl for this year. And this is just a mild infection, I, I might add too. Uh, most of the time when you see uh, a peach leaf curl infection, it's every leaf is, is, is affected. And what will happen is, is the peach will then actually drop all those leaves and end up refoliating. Uh, but it will also lose a lot of peaches in that process because the leaves aren't there to help with the photosynthesis and the fruit formation. Uh, now, if you do get peach leaf curl year in and year out, uh, it can help lead to the decline and therefore death of the peach tree. So now I wanna get into some of the insect pests. And I know we just did a broad shot on just a couple of the diseases out there and funguses out there. Um, but I wanna get into insects because it's actually insects that end up uh, ruining the party a little bit on, on, some, of the, on some of your fruit crop. Um, and it's particular insects. It's not all insects. There are a lot of insects that are, are good, very beneficial. We'll, we'll definitely talk about those. So um, basically you need to know the life cycle and the biology of the pest to know how to treat it. And so here we are with the diagram. Uh, this is your basic moth life cycle. And so I'll tell you right now, we are in uh, late February. Most of the moths, the, the fruit pest moths that we face, they are in this pupa stage. So if you look at nine o'clock there on the diagram, uh, it's, it's the, the pupa stage. Well, as the fruit trees begin to break bud, as our temperatures begin to warm up, they go from the pupa stage to the full adult moth. At that point, the, the adults they start mating and then voila, eggs are laid. Well, where are those eggs laid? Most of those eggs end up getting laid actually on the host plant. So if it's a codling moth, uh, then they're going to lay eggs right on an apple blossom or a, an apple leaf or a small forming apple fruit. So then the uh, egg hatches, the larva comes out, the larva starts chewing into the apple blossom or the forming apple fruit. And then they go through the different life cycles. At some point, about the fifth stage, uh, as, as after they're done eating the fruit, they will climb out of the fruit and then they'll start the pupation all over again. So this is just little bit about, you know, sort of general life cycle, and this is of a moth. Um, and then some of these moths or some of these pests, they may have multiple life cycles in a year. So uh, we'll talk about, you know, some of these individual insects and their life cycles, and then how we can end up disrupting their life cycle. So we're gonna just go through kind of a fruit tree pest overview. We'll talk about some foliar pests and, and more, more kind of tree pests. And then we'll also talk about fruit pests. Now, oriental fruit moth is actually both. It's both foliar and fruit. And so it, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit separately. But uh, then there are things like aphids. And aphids are something where if you see aphids, oftentimes you can just wash them off. You could, you could, take, uh, you could take the hose and blast them off. And if you'll look at this photo, this is very characteristic. You will see a bunch of little insects on the underside of a leaf and that leaf has been crinkled. So at that point, 
you can, if, if, I guess if you're squeamish, you, you can just uh, blast it off with water. But really the best way is just to, to take your thumb and forefinger and just wipe them off. Uh, that's kind of the sure way to know that they're dead. Now here is the uh, peach tree borer. We're gonna talk about this uh, more explicitly. There are lots of miscellaneous loopers and these are uh, mostly foliar pests. There are things like spider mites, which can be a problem, but not so much. And then there are some generalists like bagworms, uh, which yes, they, they host on juniper plants, but they also host on apple plants. And then there are Japanese beetles, which is everybody's favorite to talk about. And they are definitely a pest of fruit trees. So we'll go in kind of not, not one by one with everyone, but hit some of the highlights here. So for those of you with peaches, and notice that, that peaches, we, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of pest issues with peaches. It's why we quite frankly don't recommend peaches uh, when we plant a lot of our orchards, but also we recognize that peaches are one of the tastiest of fruits. So, you know, there's a little give and take there. I love peaches too, but they have a lot of pests. And so this just happens to be one of the pests that we have to deal with, with peaches. And if you've grown peaches in the past, you may have seen this. So if you look at the top photo, you see all of the black gunk right around the soil level where the, where the root crown is. That is characteristic of peach tree bore damage. So you have sap flowing out of the base of the trunk. It's flowing out for a reason. And that reason is you have these little larvae that are circling around the trunk of that tree, eating the tree, and the sap is flowing out of the tree. So this is something that's caused by these bugs that are in the trap. It's a clear wing moth uh, called the, the greater peach tree boar. And they lay eggs in the kind of May, June, July and September timeframe, and they always focus right around the base of peach trees, although they do also uh, get into cherries and some of the other stone fruits, but peaches are definitely their favorite. So this is one that, that we're kind of constantly on the lookout for and constantly trying to prevent. Um, so what we will end up doing for uh, the, this particular pest is when we know it is actively flying, we will apply a neem insecticide spray to the trunk of the tree, but we will also wrap window screen around the trunk of the tree. That window screen helps serve as a protectorant, uh, so the adult will not lay eggs, uh, doesn't have a good place to lay eggs. Um, we will also plant chives, and chives serve as a, a scent disruptor uh, around the base of the tree. And then if we actually see this kind of damage, we will go in with the pocket knife or with, a, with a, a wire, and we will deworm the tree. And so you can see those big, big grubs in there. And this photo was taken around, uh, I think it was around March, April. Now, when the, when the eggs first hatch out, and they'll first hatch out in kind of September, October, uh, those little larvae are very small. And so sometimes you'll end up seeing 50 to 100 of these little larvae uh, that time of year. Now that's actually the time of year to to get after them if you're going to deworm, but sometimes you, you don't see it until much later. And so, yeah, this is pretty much almost a, a full-grown fifth instar larva getting ready to pupate. There are other bores out there um, that, that can uh, affect apple trees. We don't have them in kind of the, the, same, uh, the same way that we have uh, the greater peach tree bore. Japanese beetles, 
this is uh, this is a pest that year in and year out, and it always sparks a lot of conversation amongst gardeners um, that we do have. So typically with Japanese beetles, we start to see the adults, the flying ones. Uh, we see those at the beginning of beginning to mid June is when we start to see them. Once we're regularly getting temperatures in the 80s. And uh, especially after, after kind of a, a good rain and the temperatures are in the 80s, the soil is soft enough. And these little grubs, the larval form, they start to metamorphize into these beetles. And so these beetles will, will crawl out and then they fly. And all they do is they just eat and mate. That's if you've ever seen Japanese beetles, it's just yeah, yeah, they're 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 gluttonous creatures. So they will be uh, they they host on so many different plants. They they feed on at least three hundred different species of plants. So roses, viburnums, uh, but then when it comes to our fruits, uh, they love apples. They love sweet cherries. And then there are grapes and hazelnuts and raspberries too. So a wide variety of fruits. Uh, so they, they definitely are a problem and they can lead to defoliation. So after they've emerged, they, they fly and, and mate for about four to six weeks. And during that four to six weeks, you will see that they end up skeletonizing the foliage. And this photo is not the best to really see the full skeletonizing, but you can notice how that leaf has been kind of torn up a little bit. They they eat in between the veins, and and then it just the the leaf itself looks like a skeleton. So what do you do about these Japanese beetles? Now I know uh, I know there's a lot of mixed messages on on how to manage. Japanese beetles, and, and it, there's definitely not one silver bullet uh, for this pest. Uh, now, what we end up doing, not only here at the shop, but when we work with uh, some of our, our Giving Grove orchards, is we recommend uh, trapping them. And that, I know, goes against uh, some information that's out there. However, we're not talking just normal traps. We are talking uh, these mass traps. These are large traps. They're trash can sized traps. So the problem with a small trap, sort of uh, the, the ones that you would find at a hardware store or garden center um, is they are small traps, maybe quart size or gallon or two gallon bag size. Well, at the height of Japanese beetle season, uh, sort of that late June, July 4th time frame. You can be out there and one of those traps will fill up within two hours. So the problem is that trap fills up that quickly and nobody's there to empty that trap. What happens? The Japanese beetles, they fly on and they go find their favorite food, which is going to be whatever you're growing in your garden. So that's why a lot of those smaller traps are not recommended. However, these larger traps, you set them out and you set them out about 15 yards away from the crops that you're trying to protect and you leave that trap out for six weeks. That's not going to fill up with Japanese beetles. Uh, so, so this is a, a pretty innovative way to actually manage Japanese beetles. Now I will tell you, uh, you know, it takes a little bit to make one of these traps, and uh, we got the idea for this through Lincoln University. Uh, they have uh, they did some research studies on this, and so they do have a a good PDF. Uh, Lincoln University is uh, out of Jefferson City in Missouri, and if you do a quick Google on uh, Lincoln University Japanese beetle traps, it'll get you there. Uh, so you can see how to make one of these traps. Some other ways that we also uh, end up uh, 
uh, fighting the Japanese beetles is through something called milky spore, which is a soil bacteria. And this is a naturally occurring bacteria that is, you end up inoculating the soil in April and May. And then again, uh, the, the next best time to do it is going to be September, October timeframe. So basically the beetle ends up inadvertently eating the bacteria in the soil. Uh, the, once it eats the bacteria, the beetle dies and then the bacteria spreads more. So, so that is, is a, another effective way. The other nice thing about that is it doesn't kill some of the other grubs that are in the yard. And when I say grubs, I don't mean that as a, as a pejorative term. I, these are actually other insects like June beetles that are, you know, I mean, they're not necessarily beneficial, but they're not problematic. And so you just want to kill one pest and not many pests. And that can be the problem with, uh, with a broad spectrum uh, grub killer that, that you would buy uh, at any number of garden centers. So another thing that we will also do is uh, on some of our high value crops, we will spray neem uh, on the foliage and, and neem actually helps deter feeding of Japanese beetles. So uh, I do know that there are other products that are listed as insecticides uh, that you can spray on the foliage, but I know a lot of those insecticides are also a little bit harsher chemicals that honestly uh, we're not recommending to spray on fruit trees. So now I just wanna talk about some of the actual individual fruit pests, the ones that, that ruin the party, the ones that you know, you're trying to grow the fruit and you harvest the fruit. And when you cut into the fruit or bite into the fruit, well, dang it, there's a caterpillar in it. So, so let's talk a little bit about some of these and, and the, the problems that they do cause. First off, here's oriental fruit moth again, and I had this listed also um, in the uh, in the foliar pest one. And the reason I, I mentioned it in foliar pests is as, as you look at the top of this branch here, this is an indicator that you have oriental fruit moth uh, in your peaches. And this is very typical. This is something that uh, you have probably seen, but maybe didn't really, you know, didn't really think about it so much when you saw it. This is what's called a shoot strike or a tip strike that oriental fruit moths will make. So uh, what they do is, is the little moth here will lay an egg right on the stem and that egg it, it uh, the egg hatches, and then you have this little caterpillar that is just right there in the pith of the stem, just kind of eating away. So if you see this, you know you have oriental fruit moth. Now that's only part of the story because the oriental fruit moth also gets into fruit. So this is something that has as many as five, six, maybe depending on the season, seven generations uh, of life cycles uh, throughout our growing season. So what happens is once this little caterpillar climbs out of the stem, it kind of sets up somewhere either on a, on a twig uh, or in a, in a bark crevice, and then will pupate and turn into a moth. So the moth then mates, and then eggs are laid on the fruits and, and those fruits are more likely than not peaches, but can sometimes be plums or apricots and in rare instances, uh, apples and, and pears too. So oriental fruit moth is something that uh, we are constantly battling in order to get good fruit. And there are a number of things that, that you can uh, end up doing to, to help, help limit its population size. One, if you see these shoot strikes on your trees, 
uh, you actually would prune below where that shoot strike is. And the reason being is you prune that out, you've eliminated that caterpillar. So you prune it out and you actually get it out of the orchard too, which oftentimes uh, that would mean actually uh, maybe just squishing it, uh, throwing it in the compost or throwing it in the trash. So um, do that first. Now, some other things that we end up doing is uh, throughout the growing season, we'll spray various, uh, various organic insecticides uh, via neem oil, Bt, or spinosad. And so that also uh, is good control mechanism. Um, this time of year, another thing that we will do is uh, around the trees, uh, we will do just a light cultivation uh, down below the trees in the, in the mulch layer. Because uh, remember the, that one of the first slides I showed of the life cycle of the moth, right now they are in that, that uh, pupil, uh, that cocoon. And so uh, those cocoons are in the mulch layer at this point. If you stir that mulch up, uh, you start exposing those cocoons. And then between the hot weather and the cold weather, and sometimes bird predation even, uh, you've actually eliminated some of those, some of those uh, pupa, some of those cocoons. And then there are some other things that actually work as far as biological controls. There are parasitic wasps that, that will focus on the moth larva. Uh, and then if any of you have chickens, this is a great time to, to let the chickens run beneath your fruit trees. Uh, maybe encourage them a little bit by, by throwing a little bit of uh, chicken scratch down uh, beneath the trees, and they will go ahead and start scratching and pecking beneath the fruit trees. So it's a great little symbiotic relationship that, that you can have going on there. Here is codling moth. And codling moth uh, is also one that kind of ruins the fruit party that we have. Codling moth does not have as many generations uh, as oriental fruit moth, but it can be just as destructive. So here we are, we have the codling moth larva that has just been eating away at the apple. And uh, so apples, pears, and Asian pears are, are kind of the, the really the three crops that it, uh, it likes the most around here. And this is something where uh, we, will, we will spray for this and we'll talk about some of, the, some of the sprays that we'll use for this. So here's a, a pest that is less, uh, not, definitely not a caterpillar. <clears throat> So this is the uh, brown marmorated stink bug. And this actually has been a, a somewhat newer pest that we've been facing. Uh, but there are a lot of stink bugs around there, around here too, that we face that can be problematic. Um, so this particular one is brown marmorated and it can end up damaging uh, fruits as we get later into the late summer, early fall. Uh, but then there are other ones like, uh, like the uh, green stink bug, which ends up damaging fruits very early uh, in the spring and, and can disfigure a lot of fruits. So these definitely can be hard to control. Um, squash bugs are related to stink bugs. So those of you who, who do vegetable gardening, uh, you, you've probably battled squash bugs. Uh, harlequin beetles, if you've battled them, they are related as well. So uh, it's another pest that, uh, like I say, can be very difficult, especially in the adult stage. I don't believe I have a good photo of their eggs, but uh, pretty much all stink bug eggs look the same. Uh, and the, and they're, they're laid on the undersides of leaves and they kind of, uh, they're always grouped together and they look like tiny little barrels. Um, so there's a lot of literature on brown marmorated sink bug because it's sort of the, the, the newest 
invasive uh, uh, fruit pest on the block, uh, or one of the newer ones. Um, and this link, uh, I think, is still active. But like I say, you could find a lot of information online about them. This is another one that's out there uh, and can definitely be a problem if you have historically grown a lot of berry plants over the years uh, from, from strawberries uh, to raspberries. This will also uh, get into some of your vegetable crops, the, the soft bodied uh, like uh, tomatoes. Uh, so uh, we've all kind of faced fruit flies here and there, but this, this one is uh, somewhat new. Uh, I'd say past seven, eight, nine years, it, it showed up here in the, in the metro area. And it's a little bit different than most fruit flies because it ends up laying its egg inside of the fruit. Now, if you've seen these problems in your, in your berries before, you, you now may know what it is. Uh, this can be somewhat difficult to get a handle on. Uh, spinosad is one insecticide that, that will work against it. Uh, MU has uh, some good IPM guides on how to trap and monitor uh, for the spotted wing Drosophila, but I, I do want to let everybody know it, it probably is out there, uh, maybe close to where you're growing fruit. So one of the reasons we select the type of blackberries that we do uh, the Natchez variety is it actually starts to ripen before the spotted wing Drosophila emerges. So having early ripening uh, sometimes can be very key uh, to avoiding a pest. However, it definitely is a problem with, with a lot of raspberry species uh, only because raspberries ripen much later in the season. So this speaks to some of the practices also that, that we, we need to just get, get in the habit of doing um, because getting in the habit of, of these preventative practices can go actually a long way to avoiding some of these insects and disease pressure that we have with these fruits. So you never wanna see, let your orchard get to the stage of this picture. This is a, just a, 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 prime, a prime brown rot scenario. It's a prime oriental fruit moth scenario, et cetera. So, so don't you know, pick up those fallen fruits. Um, make sure that you remove diseased wood. And, and just you know, some of these are, are you know, pretty basic, but, but you know, being, being a steward of a fruit tree, Kind of requires that. So, uh, and then there are some other things too, like cleaning your tools. Make sure that you, if you're pruning, make sure that you're using that that isopropyl, that that rubbing alcohol to spray your hand pruners with when you're working between trees, because sometimes you may have pruned into a, a, a diseased tree, and if you don't clean your pruners, you're going to spread that to another tree. You'll want to pra practice good mowing. Uh, this doesn't mean mowing once a week uh, and maybe not even twice a week, but strategic mowing. And definitely one of the best times to be mowing is at the end of the season. And that way you are chopping up all of the, all of the leaves. And then you're also uh, chopping up any of those fruits. Uh, or any or any any fungal pathogens, so you're you're kind of uh, eliminating some of that at the end of the year. There are also some different cultural practices that that can be used to help fight pests in the garden, and this has nothing to do with spraying, but it's it's all about actually increasing biodiversity in the garden. So by planting a fruit tree or a fruiting plant or, or anything in essence that, that we're trying to grow uh, to feed us, um, you're also planting something that is attractive to some other insect pest. 
So if you think about it that way, you're you're already you're 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 planting this, and it's it's bringing in pests. So by planting some other things like these beneficial plants, these these plants that have long flower time periods that have good nectaries on their flowers. You're bringing in things like predator insects, like wasps, uh, like, like different uh, parasitizing flies, uh, all of these things that will, while they need the nectar to kind of give them energy, they also end up needing a caterpillar here or there to feed their young. So by either parasitizing or paralyzing. Uh, so so this, is, this can be a valuable and attractive way uh, to fight some of the insect pests that we have on our fruits. And these are called insectary gardens. We, we do have one here uh, at the shop. And uh, I, I invite you to come and take a look and, and see some of the plants that we have there. And then you'll start to understand some of the relationships between these beneficials uh, and the orchard. Another thing you could also do are plant trap crops. And, and this can be a little bit more difficult, especially if you don't have the space. However, certain crops will attract certain bugs. And if let's say you, you want to try to lure stink bugs into a certain part of the garden and away from your fruit trees, well, you can plant things like sorghum and millet or sunflowers. So trap cropping can also be a viable option. However, you know, once you have your trap crop, you need to make sure that you're destroying the pest that is on that trap crop. So there are also some other alternatives and, and like bagging. Uh, uh, I think bagging can be a valuable uh, tool in the toolbox, especially if you only have maybe one fruit tree, uh, because one or two fruit trees, uh, because then you don't have to really spray at all. You would end up, uh, in the case of these nylon footies here, you would uh, tie these onto the fruit when the fruit is about uh, dime or nickel size. And then you just leave it on until the fruit is ready to harvest. And there, you haven't, you haven't sprayed a thing. Now it is very time consuming, I will tell you. It, it, it can take a good 30 seconds uh, to tie one of these on a fruit. But if you're, if you're very much opposed to spraying, regardless of if it's a uh, organic uh, or, or conventional insecticide, then this is a, a, a viable option. Uh, you can also use things like, uh, like uh, plastic bags. However, plastic bags can be a little bit more difficult to use and you do have to notch them at the bottom uh, so the humidity does not build up in, in the plastic bag. Now I want to get into a little bit on the uh, timing of spraying. And speaking of timing, I know we're, we're uh, almost to 1.30. We've probably got another 15 minutes to go. Uh, so if you, if you need to ask some questions and, and uh, get out of here, uh, go ahead and ask them in the chat and, and I can get back with you later. So uh, this is, uh, this is uh, in particular with spraying and this is about uh, fruit bud development. And this is very important to understand uh, as far as timing goes. And understanding these terms with what we mean, this happens to be an apple tree. And so these are these different stages of growth. So I talked about dormant oil early. This is what most of our apple trees look like right now. So this is a great time to spray dormant oil. We have this silver tip and green tip. And then we have what's called half inch green. This can sometimes be a good time if you've had different uh, fungal problems. This can be a good time to spray. Oh, pardon me. So we have these other stages, tight, cluster, pink. Um, and then we have blossom. So we never spray when the trees are in blossom. That's just, that's kind of a no-brainer. 
uh, you're, you're, you want to protect the insects that are pollinating your crops. You don't want to kill them. However, what we will always do is at this point, we will end up spraying Bt or spinosad, one of those two, right around this fruit set time in between petal fall and fruit set uh, to kill out any of those fruit moth caterpillars that uh, uh, like the oriental fruit moth, like cod leg moth that are, are such a problem with our fruit crops. Uh, here we have just the, the different stages uh, different stages for pears and what it looks like. So dormant, here's late dormant, and we're kind of in a late dormant right now. We're right in between dormant and late dormant on our pears. And then there's petal fall. Petal fall, once again, is kind of that time where you will be spraying. Uh, it's also a great time to thin fruits, by the way. And here we are with peaches. And peaches are a little bit different. Uh, so peaches oftentimes, so you, you have the, the pink stage, you have swollen bud stage here. Swollen bud is that stage where if you've had peach leaf curl in the past, you would be spraying copper fungicide right now at that swollen bud stage. Here is pink stage, and you'll notice you also have some leaves coming out. And pink is just before the blossom opens. And then you have petal fall, and then you have what's called shuck split, which is, is very unique to peaches a little bit. Uh, it's, it's when the, the flower actually falls off of the, the newly forming fruit. This is another great time to be treating for that oriental fruit moth that I was talking about earlier, and a great time to, to spray like a BT or something like that. So we've, we've talked a little bit about the spray timing. I uh, wanna get into some of these different insecticides and fungicides and just kind of what they are and what they do. So there's uh, horticultural oils and there are a lot of different variations, uh, brands thereof. So there's uh, there's dormant oil, which is applied now. And actually, a, most horticultural oils are now both summer and dormant oil. It ju just depends on, on how you mix them. So you're mixing at a greater rate in the, the dormant time as opposed to during the summer time. And so there are some of these products that are that are uh, registered for organic gardening. Some are not out there. Spinosad is something that there are also a lot of different uh, products that have spinosad or spinosin out there. And this is a pretty good broad spectrum insecticide. Uh, some of it is labeled for organic production, some is not. And uh, it, the way it works is it ends up uh, not only uh, by ingestion, but also by contact, it ends up affecting the nervous system of the, the said pest. Now, this is a, a somewhat non-selective insecticide, so you would want to be careful when you're spraying it. Uh, definitely make sure you're not spraying when there are a lot of pollinators around or if anything is in flower uh, when, when you're spraying it. But it can be used on a wide variety of insects. This is neem oil, and this happens to be uh, the, the neem oil of, of kind of our choice. Uh, this happens to be a 100% neem seed oil, but there are a lot of different products out there that have different formulations of neem. Uh, we will use this uh, at a 1% at a uh, when we do some of our first sprays in the spring, but then once we start getting foliage on our trees, uh, we will end up using this at about a half percent. So this is something that you can't uh, you can't really find uh, 
locally at a lot of retailers, but you can go to this uh, Ahimsa. Uh, this is the company that sells this 100% uh, this neem seed oil. Like I say, it is a greater concentrate, uh, but it's uh, it also works. It's really effective at a lot at killing a lot of different insects. The thing is, it is also a non-selective insecticide, so you will need to be careful uh, when and where you're spraying. This is something that I, I didn't really mention too much earlier. I think it was, it was listed in some of the slides, but this is uh, kale and clay. This can be a somewhat difficult product to use. However, it, it is a very effective product. So this is, is basically used as a crop protectorant. Uh, this is sprayed on the young fruits and the foliage of trees uh, to keep insects from laying eggs on the trees. So uh, the other thing that it also does is it'll help kind of dry out any insect that may be on the tree. Um, so, the problem with this is it is a wettable powder and you end up using about a half pound per gallon. So it, it's very difficult to mix and it can clog the sprayer uh, really easily. So uh, I do suggest if, if you do invest in this, uh, you, may, you may really wanna take care to keep, keep your, uh, your spray agitated, uh, keep it well mixed up. And if you have a battery backpack sprayer or some sort of battery operated uh, sprayer with a, with a motor, I would not use this product because it well clogged the motor. But like I say, it works incredibly well. Um, it, basically the insects just don't like to be near this stuff. It's, it's inhospitable to them. It does, however, wash off after a rain but uh, you would just reapply. And, and, and normally it's just heavy rains or prolonged rains in which it washes off. So Bacillus thuringiensis, this is something I've mentioned multiple times and, and this is uh, definitely something we, we have in the toolbox for a lot of caterpillars. Now, however, it will harm butterfly caterpillars, so don't spray this on your butterfly garden or host butterfly plants. Uh, but this is used for coddling moth, oriental fruit moth, and oblique banded leaf roller, which is another fruit pest that you may sometimes uh, face. And this works by destroying uh, the caterpillar from the inside. So, uh, the caterpillar will eat the foliage that's been sprayed or the fruit that's been sprayed, and then it will end up uh, basically dying at that point. So it's a gut bacteria on, on the caterpillar. So here we have uh, uh, pyrethrum, and, and uh, there are lots of different uh, pyrethrins out there. Um, so uh, the most pyrethrins are uh, labeled for organic production, but then there are many that are, are there are also some that are not. Um, so this works as, as kind of a, a broad spectrum insecticide. And so once again, you would want to be kind of careful uh, when you're spraying it, but this is a, a plant-based insecticide from chrysanthemums. The pyganic pictured here is probably not what many folks would, would use. This is more for uh, greenhouse use, but there, there are a number of different brands. I think Safer is one of them that, that sells a, a pyrethroid. And then there are some of the other uh, natural agents that can work as repellents. Um, and, and then there are some things that could also, also help work as, as fungicides a little bit too. So while you know garlic is not labeled as a repellent, 
uh, well, guess what? It does work. So, and then there are, there are some insecticides that actually have uh, things like hot pepper oils and garlic in them. So, so these things do work. However, uh, with any homemade remedy, you might also have some sort of uh, some sort of phytotoxic effect on the plant, meaning that uh, meaning that the foliage might get burned. Uh, so it, it's why a lot of the a lot of the insecticides and fungicides that you do see are registered for certain plants. And then there are all of these other things like the nutrients and microbes. And these are sort of, these can be used as more for plant health care itself. Uh, and a, a healthy plant then is less primed to have some of these infections or in some cases, insect outbreaks. I'll get into a little bit about wildlife because uh, they are, you know, we we live here with them. Um, you know, they're they're all all earthlings as well. So things like squirrels, um, because people always always have that problem. Or they'll ask, well, gosh, you know, the squirrels are just going to take all the fruit. Well, sure, that can be a problem. Uh, in general, if you have a fruit tree out in the open, it's, it's going to be less of a problem. But uh, in some places, uh, you can't avoid squirrels. So you can do things like uh, these sheet metal baffles, which are great because the squirrel can't climb up the sheet metal and, and get into the tree. In other cases, if you're out in, in more uh, rural or park-like areas, you may need to cage your trees uh, because deer absolutely love fruit trees and, and fruit trees are kind of like deer candy. Um, in some cases, you'll need to put tree wraps on your trees. Now, uh, put them on, but then take them off again because those tree wraps are, are really only meant to be on uh, for the winter time to protect against rabbits and protect against things like sun scald. But then you need to take them off in March and let that trunk breathe again. At that point, the rabbits are finding other things to eat. Uh, so, so, you know, by leaving the tree wrap on, uh, too much humidity and moisture can build up and then you can have insect problems or fungal problems on the trunk. And then also there's uh, the weed eater wildlife that out, that's out there too. And it's a good reason to make sure your trees are well mulched. Um, and if you're not in charge of the mowing, make sure that uh, whomever is knows not to weed eat around the trees. And then there's bird protection. Uh, birds can be a problem with some fruit crops. I'm not a big fan of utilizing bird netting. The problem I have with bird netting is birds actually get caught in the netting. And if you've ever seen a bird that is dead hanging from bird netting, you don't want to see that again. Uh, so I, I think that's a problem. Uh, however, there are some other things that can help. Uh, one thing that uh, we found a number of years ago is uh, this product called Humming Line that uh, you can you can go online and find this product, although it can can be a little bit challenging. But it's almost like cassette tape if anybody remembers audio cassettes, and it is uh, it is strung up from pole to pole, and when it catches the wind, it emits uh, both a high and low frequency that actually the birds will just end up flying away which is kind of nice because it can go a long way to protecting either a cherry crop or a blueberry or a blackberry crop. And then there are some of the other, you know, simple things like hanging wind chimes in a tree uh, or having CDs or, or kind of shiny uh, Christmas ornaments in the tree. Those also will distract birds. And yeah, sure, eventually birds will, will find some of your crop, but if you distract them for long enough, you get most of the crop. The birds only get just a pittance. 
So finally, I have just a, a whole list of resources. And this is something that as homeowners, you can, I think, go to all of these. And, and, uh, and it's a wealth of knowledge. Uh, and you could also purchase from some of these places. Arbico Organics and Peaceful Valley Farms are good places to find a lot of uh, organic insecticides and fungicides. Uh, you know, in some cases, our local garden centers will carry these, but in some cases, uh, uh, like, like with kale and clay, you will not find that at local garden centers. Great Lake IPM, uh, they do a lot of pheromone traps, and if you're really into growing fruit, you will want to investigate that. And then a lot of these others are just really good uh, educational resources, Cornell and Nafex. And then these books, um, uh, the, the Growing Organic Orchard Fruits and Michael Phillips' The Holistic Orchard, both of those are, are great books uh, for understanding how to grow fruit and grow it organically and biologically based. Barbara Bowling has a, this great book on berry growing. And then Lee Reich is, uh, is a great author who has a gardening blog and, and he uh, writes extensively on a number of different fruit crops. So uh, I think with that, uh, if, if there are any questions that did not get answered, I will gladly uh, entertain those. And we can, we can uh, take some more, we can, I can have some more questions here now too. Hey, Matt, I just sent you um, two emails. Sorry, one of them got sent early, but there's two emails I sent you full of questions from the chat. Oh, okay. Well, here is questions number two that I'm answering now. Okay, so first one, if you prune an apple or a pear in late February, or early March, then it freezes for a week, does it hurt the tree? Now, in, in, in general, no. No, as long as you've, you've pruned uh, when when it's above freezing. Yeah, yeah, we, we have a lot of weather that goes back and forth this time of year. And uh, uh, the, the takeaway is, is do it, but do it while it's above freezing. Uh, when it becomes problematic is if you actually prune in, let's say, late fall or early winter. Uh, that can definitely be problematic because you're going into a long winter spell with a, a new pruning cut. And that's when you will get cracking and, and things like that where that new pruning cut was made. So no, that's, that's not a problem. Uh, if I'm moving blackberry bushes, should I do it now and then prune them like I say? So, um, so I I would move yeah I would I would move the blackberry bushes like this whole next week looks like a great time to to dig up and transplant uh, the blackberries as far as pruning them um, yeah you, so I mean that's that's sort of a, a longer question there but yes get the dead out of the wood uh, out of the plant and you could always tell the dead because they're the brittle. Uh, brownish, uh, grayish canes. Um, and then, yes, try to uh, get them uh, up on a trellis line if you can. And typically, uh, the trellis lines are set at about four feet. Uh, so, yeah. And is there a problem with using chopped mulched leaves as mulch around fruit trees? Uh, no, in, in, in general, uh, not. Uh, you know, let's say we have a lot, of, you know, we, we always get a lot of leaves in the fall, and most of them are oak leaves because it takes a while for them to break down. In general, that is, is, uh, is not too much of a problem. And were there other questions with the questions one there? Ah, where can we get limb spreaders? Yeah, so that is something uh, we are going to make. We're going to make some of them available in bundles. Um, although I will tell you, it may be expensive uh, to to go look on on Amazon. Um, I, I haven't looked at the prices on Amazon lately, but uh, uh, so if if you are to go on Amazon because we, we have yet to get our limb spreaders in and get them priced. But if, if you are to go on to Amazon, 
if you look up twig eased, so T W I G E, is it E E Z E? If you type something something akin to that, uh, twig ease is where you would end up. Uh, uh, though that's what the product is called. And oftentimes you'll see them in a, a wide, uh, like a, a mixed pack from, from like six, nine, 12 and 15 inch, something like that. Uh, what is the minimum percent of rubbing alcohol we should use? Um, so typically like a 70%, like a uh, which is sort of normal, uh, what you find at most, uh, most of the, the pharmacies, the CVSs, uh, et cetera. So 70% is, is what we use. Uh, what, what we'll do is, is get a quart of it and then uh, pour it into a spray bottle and end up spraying uh, our hand pruners or our pruning saw and then uh, we'll have a, a rag to wipe that down with. And then the brand of orchard ladder that, uh, that we utilize is Stokes and uh, S-T-O-K-E-S. Uh, you know, orchard ladders are, are not the cheapest uh, thing out there. Um, so I, I would check, you know, before you uh, order from Stokes, you may want to check, um, you know, one of, the, one of the various marketplaces out there, be it Facebook Marketplace or uh, Craigslist or, or something along those lines. Um, because you know, a good orchard ladder, especially like a 10 foot orchard ladder, it's probably going to run you $400 if not more. And these things do get shipped from, from, from afar. So uh, unfortunately they're, they're kind of a niche product around here. We're not exactly an orchard country the way California and Michigan are, uh, but you may be able to find uh, some deals out there locally. Okay. And, and Matt, there's one more in the chat. Uh, can you explain the fig pruning again? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so with figs, um, it, the figs basically, they, they end up, they, they always overwinter, or at least most of the time they overwinter unless we have a ridiculously cold winter. Um, and they end up dying back, however, so the, the wood will die back. But depending on the year, sometimes they'll die back a little bit. Uh, they, they won't die back all the way to the ground. So they'll, they'll die back maybe three, four, five, you know, a foot, in, uh, a, a foot of stem above the ground. So I always like to wait until the buds have broken on the fig before I prune. That way I'm getting some of that wood that's overwintered. And that wood that's overwintered is important because that wood that's overwintered will produce a fig crop a little bit earlier than most of the rest of the figs. So um, it's, it's, just that's that's the reason I like to do it. Some people will prune these things down to the ground in late fall and and put a layer of mulch over them. The fig will still live, but you won't have any canes that will have overwintered. So it'll just be like a perennial and be coming up from the ground. So uh, hopefully that kind of answers the question a little bit. Okay. I think that's uh, that's all we got for today. So um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. And like I said, go to our virtual workshop page if you wanna see a recording of this. And uh, if you have any additional questions, uh, can, you can send them to uh, matt at kccg.org. So uh, everybody have a good weekend and uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. All right, thank you very much.